Okay, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for guidance? Mm -hmm. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you this afternoon, we ask, Father, that the scriptures that we are about to read may become clear. We ask, Father, for your guidance, for your direction, and for your blessing. Join with us, please, in this study. Mm -hmm. Send your angels so that we may understand, be guided, and be prepared for what is soon to break upon this world. I ask a blessing upon each one that is here and those that will view these later. We ask, Father, that we may truly seek your will and seek your face, as did your servant Moses. Help us in these ends. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Now, before you is what I use to prepare for notes. Going into the Bible using the original headings that were presented for use in the 1769 Bible, King James. Now, we're going to have several things that we're going to cover today. If we get through eight to 10 verses, that's, that'll be a good day. Okay. Now, as we see the headings that are on this chapter for Malachi 3, I'm going to ask if you recall the premise that we are using in addressing the book of Malachi. Are we looking at this as literal or are we looking at this as figurative? Well, we've been looking at it as figurative. Right. Figurative. Yeah. Now, here again, the, the reason behind looking at this in a figurative manner is we are looking at this letter as being written for our time rather than the time that it was written, right? Mm -hmm. So we covered part of this last, last Sunday. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall su suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, who you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this has had several literal applications already. Now, in sending his messenger, we can look prior to when this letter was written and see that Elijah was a messenger of the covenant. But here we can also see that John the Baptist was a messenger that prepared the way before Christ. And that Christ was the literal messenger of the covenant, right? Mm -hmm. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. So, Peter, Peter. Okay, why Peter? God did choose him, being last man, to see his coming second time he wanted him to live. I don't he know why he yeah. died. So the question is, if he if he uh, is alive when I come, what is that to thee? Yes. Okay, but that doesn't mean that he's going to be alive. No, uh, um, <laughs> uh, I did watch that 
I bought that movie. Peter told it about that story about Jesus will be helping Peter's make a letters tell of his second Bible. Peter not get killed, died till he see the face of the Lord till he make that a sacrifice and trust in him. Yeah, I understand. So you've seen this in a movie, but I think they're misinterpreting the verse. So the verse is John 21, 20. And it's actually, um, I think there's some things here that are quite important that... Uh, that yes, uh, but one small thing that did hold me back and more more that did hold me back. Okay. I don't know what that means. Okay, so it says, well, let me read the verse. It says, then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. So this is Peter um, and that's, that's uh, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following. That's John, which also leaned on his breast at, at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing him saith to jesus lord and what shall this man do and jesus saith unto him if i if if i will that he tarry till i come what is that to thee follow thou me then went this saying abroad among the brethren that th that disciple should not die yet jesus said not unto him he shall not die but if i will that he tarry till i come what is that to thee So how, how could we make an application of this? I, I've... Well, making an application of Peter or making an application of what we're dealing with in this study? In this study. Okay. Well, the point that I was about to make is, of course, we have applied in the past Isaiah 40, verse 3. Mm -hmm. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And we've seen this applied many times about John the Baptist. Right. Now, if we look further, Haggai 2.7, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. Now, the house that we're talking about here is the house built with living stones. Yeah, because we're applying it to the end. Correct. Yeah. And I think the, the following verse of Malachi 4.1 gives a, a second witness to this. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And this is, this is actually applying this even further because it's applying something that's going to occur at the end of the thousand years, which we would recognize as being typified by the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. So, you know, so one of the things that's interesting, like when you look at the prophecies, in Isaiah, and, yeah. and I would say even here in Malachi, that mostly people look at this as applying to Christ's first coming only. Right. But, they, but, but we know that there is a double meaning, that even though they, they apply to Christ's first coming, they also apply to his second coming. And, and, and a good example of this is um, Isaiah 61, when Jesus quotes the passage, when he gets up in, in the synagogue to, to, to read, you know, where he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound, 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he doesn't continue reading and the day of vengeance of our God. He leaves that out. Right. So he applies part of it to his first coming. But we know that this must all apply to the second coming, not just the last part. It's not split apart. It's not like the first coming and the second coming are, are different prophecies. They're actually one in the same prophecy, but Christ's first coming is typifying his second coming. So could we, could we say then that as the Savior quoted this verse, Mm -hmm. uh, um, excuse me, please, guys. Just wait, Mark. I... Let, let Dwight finish first. Okay. Okay. He was that the Savior was showing the opening of his ministry, but was not quoting from what would become the close of his ministry. I mean, mm -hmm. the close meaning the ultimate close. Yeah, and, now, and also what's being talked about here is to procl proclaiming the liberty of the captives. I mean, this is, is the sabbatical jubilee cycle. Which takes us right back to Leviticus 25 and 26. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Mark, you had a comment? Um, I... I heard... You guys, I heard you, you too. I in heard of you two talking about his like a comment mm -hmm. of I heard in this of Son of God movie I did but. I am show you. Um, it is saying, it is saying he don't know when he coming again. Second time, his own father knows. Yeah, it says that in the Bible, that only the Father knows the day yes. of the hour. Right. Yes. Not the Son. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we know that. That's why we don't know the day or the hour of Christ coming yet until it's proclaimed from heaven. No, um, A is, he said, just my own, he said, just my own name. Father knows. Right. So the Father is going to tell us. So the Father is going to proclaim it from heaven just before Jesus comes back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Dwight. Okay. Now, as we continue with this, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, the figurative portion of this, I think, is, is rather weighty for us. Mm -hmm. Because in order to refine and purify silver, the refiner sits in front of a very hot fire until all of the dross is consumed and he sees his reflection. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking of the sons of Levi, the application in a broad sense could be the corporate church, but in a refined sense, I would say is the movement. Then yeah, shall, and, go ahead. yeah, and, and the, well, the 144,000 as well. I mean, we know that because my understanding of this, this offering in righteousness that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, that that offering is the 144,000. Okay. Going to my study on Hebrews, where it talks about they without us would not be, cannot be made perfect. All the ones that died in faith are dependent upon the final generation reflecting Christ's character fully. And that would be the 144,000. And they would be the sons of Levi. 
because there's priests and Levites. Priests are Levites, but the Levites themselves are not the priests. So in, in at least in the type that we're using the symbols here, this would refer to the final generation. Not some group within the final generation. Okay. Now, as as a, a bridge verse, the next one reads, and I'm, I'm going to use the alternate reading. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in ancient years. Mm -hmm. Taking us to this. And I will come near to you in judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, oppressing the alternate reading is defrauding. Mm -hmm. So first, purify the sons of Levi, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're looking at this, what offering can the, the, these purified sons of Levi offer well the only thing they can offer is themselves are you sure well that's my understanding of it now the way that i take this that because when you look at the sanctuary Mm -hmm. All the offerings have sins confessed upon them. The only offering that doesn't is the Lord's goat. What about the trespass offerings? Well, they're not dealing with sin. What you mean, the trespass offerings? They have sins confessed on them. Okay. Any, any offering that deals with sins has sins confessed upon it. Right? So, I mean... Obviously, there are some offerings that don't thank offerings and so forth. But any offering that deals with sin, a trend, trespass offering, a sin offering, they're going to have sins confessed upon them. Our thank the, offerings, are, are thank offerings going to be considered in them? Yeah, well, thank offerings wouldn't have sins confessed on, th on them. So I guess you could say thank offerings. Okay. But when I think about on that the offering in righteousness, this to me would be the Lord's goat which is, to me, represents the 144,000 or the finished work of Christ. And it's that offering that cleanses the sanctuary. Once Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, that that number is made up, then he can confess the sins upon the head of the scapegoat. Okay. Right. So whether I'm correct about that or not, I don't know. But... That's been my understanding for a long time. Okay. That you have to have that final generation. Now, the sins are going to be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat. And then the Lord's goat, the 144,000, they're going to have to go through the time without a mediator. And when we read, when we studied into that about the Lord's goat, that the that Azazel, the scapegoat, is seeking to escape from the hands of the fit man and if he escaped then the sins would not be forgiven right they wouldn't be cleansed they wouldn't be removed they wouldn't be blotted out and and so ellen white talks about this that this struggle that happens and that's the struggle that satan is having during the time of jacob's trouble during the period of the plagues because he's doing everything he can to discourage the saints so that they will give up their faith in God and he can't make them do it. So, so to me, it would be a fitting symbol 
that the offering that's offered in righteousness is the 144,000 that is they're offering themselves. Okay. Now, you, you have other ideas on this, I guess. Well, all what I'm getting at from Malachi 3, yeah. 3 is that Christ as the refiner and purifier of silver mm -hmm. first must purify these sons of Levi mm -hmm. that they may offer an offering in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, you know, there, there's going to be a point that I'll be making as to that offering here in a moment. Okay. That when they have made this offering, they will then Christ will come near in judgment. Okay. So could we agree that until those sons of Levi are purified and until they begin this offering that Christ cannot come? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a point that in a figurative sense is clearly being represented in these three verses? Well, I would think so. Um, I mean, this is, there are other Adventists who talk about this. I mean, what has to happen, why Jesus hasn't come yet. And that is, there is a work that needs to be accomplished. And, and this is my point is that on the day of atonement, you're going you're gonna to have these different offerings, but the offering that really closes up the day of atonement, there's two of them. That's the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. And so the Lord's goat has to cleanse the sanctuary before the sins can be confessed upon the scapegoat. And to me, the Lord's goat, we, we look at it, we say it's Christ. But it, it is Christ, but in his people. That's the way that I understand it. Okay. That there is this, this final generation, you know, we call it last generation theology, but that final generation has to perfect a Christian character. And that has to be done before the close of probation, because the close of probation is just announcing what is. It doesn't affect a change. There's no new nature given to anybody at the close of proba probation. God is just declaring that he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is wicked, let him be wicked still, right? He that's unclean, let him be unclean still. He's not, he's not making a change. He's just declaring what is. And the thing that brings about that change is a message, an acceptance or rejection of a message. So we would have to believe that in the last days, that there is a proclamation of a message that's going to affect a change in those that either receive it or those that reject it. Okay. And that it's going to cause their close of probation. And then God declares the close of probation when everyone has made their decision. All right. Any other thoughts? Well, I too came to the understanding that this was not an arbitrary point in time that God picked to say this is the close of probation, but it was a time where everybody had made up their mind and whether they rejected Christ or received him. Mm -hmm. Just um, wondering, if, if, do, do you have any idea of, of the uh, previous events? It so, says there, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in days of old. It's not, it's been quite vague. 
is not specifying, but there's, there's some times in the history when things were offered that God says and he, it's an abomination. But then right. there's some thing, times there's histories when things are offered and it's pleasant to the Lord. And, and, and sometimes, you know, he would, yeah. the offerings would, uh, I'm thinking like the temple when they were dedicated, mm-hmm. you had fire coming down, smoke falling in the temple, that type of thing. So I'm just wondering, have you thought about any particular events of days of old, which the uh, offering of Judah and Jerusalem here can be pleasant? Well, I would ask the question is, were the offerings pleasant during the time of the wilderness sojourn when the glory of God filled the tabernacle? Were the offerings pleasant in the early early years of Solomon when the offerings made were accepted by fire? Mm -hmm. One of the problems that we've been having is that Many of the offerings, many of the things that have been being presented before God have been being presented not from a willing heart, but out of a sense of obligation. And is that what God wants? No. Does does he want us to feel that, that we're just obligated and this is what we have to do rather than what we want to do no that's like our tithes and offerings he wants a cheerful giver and so you know this could fall on that line i agree Mm -hmm. now some of what i'm going to say today could step on some toes and i'm not i'm not afraid to do that so there's there's going to be some things that i'm going to ask about for your consideration. So we're going to continue through this, but in in answering some of this, um, Malachi 1 verse 1 reads as follows, Stephen, for from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Right now, God's name is not great among the world. We have too many things where within this church, as we have been going through this, that we've accepted too many doctrines that are not according to the biblical standard. Focusing like on theories conspiracy theories and and other things yep agreed we've chosen the sayings of man as our rule of faith rather than the word of god yeah now sometimes the the sayings of man are are not us caught following other men but just following our own hearts yep that is often people will talk about, oh, we shouldn't follow man. Um, but yet, really, they want us to follow them. Agreed. You know, um, or, or, you know, the other one is a person, and Jeff has brought this up before, you know, you have these people saying, well, every person, we should only study for ourselves. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. And yet they will be presenting arguments that they want us to listen to. And if they really believe that, they wouldn't be presenting any positions at all because they would just tell other people, go study for yourselves. So, so when it comes to, to understanding what God wants, as far as, as doctrines, we've come to the view that we need to study together, that God's leading a movement, 
but we have to follow what Ellen White says regarding how to study, which is Miller's rules, and all of the rules that come from Miller's rules that are the result of following Miller's rules, such as the symbolic use of numbers or the triple application of prophecy that Miller doesn't explicitly mention. But if you follow his rules, you will find that those are in accordance with his rules. Dwight, what was that last scripture you read? Uh, the last one that I was reading, Malachi 1 verse 1. 1 1. Excuse me, 1 verse 11. My fault. Okay. Okay, My that's fault. better. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Now, this next section is going to be kind of interesting. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, this is, this is the verse on which I have placed the understanding that Leviticus 25 and 26, as presented, would be the covenant first given to the nation of Israel and later given strictly to the priests because it gives us both blessings and curses. Mm -hmm. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you say, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, if we take this literally, it's very specific. We've robbed in tithes and offerings. How can we take this portion figuratively? And I know this is a, a difficult thought and a different, different way of looking at this. Well, the tithe is a tenth, which is a remnant. Right. And, and these offerings are actually heave offerings, I believe. At least that's the way I understand it. Um, so if we take the offering that we are to offer, because that's the offering in righteousness, um, we've robbed him of the remnant and of the people that he's going to lift up as an enzyme, the, the heave offering that he's going to lift up of his people. So basically they've, we've robbed God by not following him. Okay. It, at least that's an application we could to use it symbolically. Okay. Now I'm going to return to this, but I'm going to stop the share and, and put up a different screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to read a bit from Spirit of Prophecy. Now, in preparing for the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, Mrs. White put the following out in Review and Herald. The tithe was to be exclusively devoted to the use of the Levites, the tribe that had been set apart for the service of the sanctuary. But this was by no means the limit of the contributions for religious purposes. 
The tabernacle as afterward the temple was erected wholly by free will offerings and to provide for necessary repairs and for other expenses. Moses directed that as often as the people were numbered, each should contribute a half a shekel for the service of the tabernacle. In the time of Nehemiah, a contribution was brought yearly for this purpose. From time to time, sin offerings and thank offerings were brought to God. These were presented in great numbers at the annual feasts, and the most liberal provision was made for the poor. To promote the assembling of the people for religious service, as well as to provide for the poor, a second tithe of all increase was required. Concerning the first tithe, the Lord had declared, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel. But in regard to the second, he commanded, thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thy oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and their, of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. This tithe or its equivalent in money, were for two years to bring to the place where the sanctuary was established. After presenting a thank offering to God and a specified portion to the priest, the offerers were to use the remainder for a religious feast in which the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow should participate. Thus provision was made for the thank offerings and feasts at the yearly festivals, and the people were drawn to the society of the priests and the Levites that they might receive instruction and encouragement in the service of God. Every third year, however, this second tithe was to be used at home in entertaining the Levite and the poor, as Moses said, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. This tithe would provide a fund for the uses of charity and hospitality. Now, this is part of what Mrs. White has referred to as the Jewish economy. Mm -hmm. And when she's talking about hospitality there, it's not about your friends having them over. Right. It means like taking people into your home, uh, providing for their needs. That's Correct. Sort of Hang on for a second. Okay. In 1890, she wrote to Joshua with Eliezer, the high priest, and the heads of the tribes, the distribution of the land was committed, the location of each tribe being determined by lot. Moses himself had fixed the bounds of the country as it was to be divided among the tribes when they should come in possession of Canaan and had appointed a prince from each tribe to attend to the distribution. The tribe of Levi being devoted to the sanctuary service was not counted in this allotment, but 48 different cities in different parts of the country were assigned to the Levites as their inheritance. Here we have a point from the early portion of the history of the children of Israel, that the Levites were appointed to cities, but not to directly to territories. Mm -hmm. In God's plan for Israel, every family had a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. Thus were provided both the means and the incentive for useful, industrious, and self-supporting life. And no devising of men has ever improved upon that plan. Mm -hmm. To the world's departure from it is owing to a large degree the poverty and the wretchedness that exists today. God showed us a plan. Mm -hmm. Plan that works. It doesn't say here that we're going to go out and build apartment complexes and that we're going to house everybody within the cities. There were ways where every family 
had land, had an area to live, had an area to grow food. Mm -hmm. At the settlement of Israel in Canaan, the land was divided among the whole people, the Levites only as ministers of the sanctuary, being accepted from the equal distribution. The tribes were numbered by families, and to each family, according to its numbers, was appointed an inheritance. And although one might for a time dispose of his possession, he could not permanently barter away the inheritance of his children. When able to redeem his land, he was at liberty at any time to do so. Debts were remitted every seventh year. And in the 50th or the year of Jubilee, all landed property reverted to the original owner. The land shall not be sold forever, was the Lord's direction. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man himself be able to redeem it, he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is one of the reasons they didn't observe the sabbatical year and the Jubilee year from the time that they had kings. Right. Because they were there financially. It, it was too difficult, at least that. It impoverished be. them. Yeah, it impoverished them. They were impoverished by the kingship. And so uh, they just never did follow this since the time of the kingship. Ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Thus, every family was secured in its possession, and a safeguard was afforded against the extremities of either wealth or want. That's, that's a large statement. Now, let's consider the following. Well, just to go back on that. So when she says, thus every family was secured its possession and a safeguard was afforded against the extremes of either wealth or want. The one thing is that we see in this world is um, adding lands to lands that wouldn't have been possible under the Jewish economy. Right. In other words, you likely would not have had a home and two or three vacation homes. <laughs> yeah. And you couldn't have a land speculator like Trump uh, become extremely wealthy. Or one like Bill Gates. Yeah. These situations would not have occurred in the Jewish economy. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't it wasn't economy built upon socialism and charity um, because it, it provided for each person to provide for themselves. Right. Exactly. It would be in situations where you have widows or orphans or people with illnesses. Those would be the, the poor. It wouldn't be just, you know, generally people are poor because they don't have any opportunities. Everyone had an opportunity to live. Everyone had an opportunity to be able to not just live, but also to thrive because they would have been able to provide for themselves and for their families. Yeah. Now, 
I'm returning to the question that I asked a few minutes ago. On Malachi 8, 3, 8, and 9, are we to take this literally or do we take, can we also take this figuratively for our time and how do we do so? I think you're right, Theodore, that this could very well be giving us a representation in robbing God that we are keeping people from being able to hear the, the true gospel. Mm-hmm. So the Levites inheritance, Levites portion was really within the tithe. Mm-hmm. And the tithe that we're, that's being described here figuratively would be the remnant. Mm-hmm. It's not money. And one of the questions I've had to ask myself at times is, where are we to pay tithe? Are we to pay tithe to a church that's in apostasy? Is well, this- that's, yeah, that's a difficult question now that we have in this movement. I mean, we did have some place we could pay tithe. Right. Now we don't have any sort of organization. And, self-supporting, and- self-supporting ministries. That are doing the work you could do that yeah but do we i mean the work that that's supposed to be done is the work of this movement that's where our energies are to be placed but it's difficult when we don't have any sort of organization for people to to send their tithes and offerings to so it, it's almost as if we have to use those to promote the work wherever we are but god's not just asking for a tenth of our money he's really asking for everything yeah this time i think he's been asking for everything throughout yeah because you know as as i was as i'm preparing to answer some questions this next week one of the things that that's really clear is the firstborn whether you're talking man or beast was to be was to be dedicated to God. Mm-hmm. So in this portion from Malachi, is is this referring to robbing God in land or in livestock? Now, most of us are not ranchers. We don't keep livestock. Mm -hmm. and the majority of us that are in this movement do not own a bunch of land either no so the premise that i'm looking at is is it possible that the tithe that's being referred to here from malachi 3 8 and 9 are the souls that are then saved from the earth Mm -hmm. are we standing in god's way of his plan of salvation. Is this how we're robbing him? Well, I know the church always likes to present these verses because they want to get money for right. the church. But but I don't think that the money is being used wisely and no, it's, it's not, not being used the way that it's supposed to be used. Um, but you know i mean i supported the church for a lot of years and then came into this movement began supporting this movement but now basically everything we have is god's and and all we are looking to do is to complete the work that he asked us to do agreed and and people can feel that you know they've paid their tithe they've done everything they needed to do but God is asking for us a lot more than just a 10% of our income or even 20% in, in accomplishing this work at the end of the world. And, and, and I don't see how we could be living to sort of, well, I'm going to buy some land and I'm going to live out in the country. I'm going to have my home and, and all those types of things. At least for me, somebody who's older and has already raised a family. Um, even, even, you know, a number of, before I married Heidi, I was looking at, 
you know, having nothing and just being involved in the work. You know, using my time, of course, it, things changed, but. You know, we, we can't be planning our life on this earth, all of our creature comforts. Right now, we're at the end of the world. And, and everything has to be committed to doing God's work. It, it is, it, it is, will be coming soon when he coming, he being with them will be happen. Yeah. I don't know about that. Now he speak that to me right now. Okay. He Thanks. wanted to he speak that to me now. He wanted me to say that with you guys. Okay, thanks, Mark. And but right now you he is that talking to me again. Okay. That's good to hear. Now let's compare these these following passages. Malachi 3, verse 17, which we're going to cover again. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my special treasure, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Now, the reason this is in bold, this is the alternate reading for this verse. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Is this not a promise from God that if we obey his voice, keep his covenant, that we would be treasured above all others? That we would be his special treasure? Deuteronomy 7, 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. For the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Psalm 135, verse 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Titus 2.14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works? And then 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. These are the admonitions and the promises that are being presented to those that would heed the warnings of Malachi and choose to accept the covenant of God. Any thoughts, questions, or additions to this? Mm. Lord, do you say to me now, you not of a hard box about mysteries of my past. I done.
All right. Any other comments? One thing that came to me was Romans 12. I started with one and two, and then I just read the whole chapter because it's all it's all applying to us uh, about presenting our ourselves as as a living living sacrifice and giving all to Him, and that we should be using our gifts and growing in Him. Good point. It's interesting to me when you were taking a look at this in Malachi, figuratively instead of literally, the other aspects that are coming out and the, the other as aspects that we're able to discuss. Because this opens up another door if you take it figure, figuratively. Awesome. Exactly. Many times when I've heard, especially Malachi 3, 8, and 9 being presented within a series given at the church, the only thing come out have been about the money. And the thing that, that, that I look at is that this is stepping on the same ground that Ellen White, Elliot Wagner, and Alonzo T. Jones stepped on in 1888 in their series at the General Conference session at that year. Because they were pointing to how the church could become righteous by faith and not by works. It's also interesting to me that when you, when you read a lot from what Mrs. White had to say at that time, that when the three of them were giving their presentations after that session, that huge tithes poured in unbidden. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have to mention these things. And the money was coming in and coming in greatly and that the church was more afraid of what could happen through this presentation because of, of, of the money being freely given. They, were expect, they, they didn't expect this to happen. And they were afraid that they were going to lose the monetary control over the church. Mm. They were more like Esau. They were afraid of not having the money than they were of receiving the spiritual blessing. Mm -hmm. Here we are given a series of verses, a series of examples of the promises that we can expect to see God keep when we are willing to keep his covenant and honor him before we honor ourselves or anyone else. So, now just uh, the three verse nine. Yes. Cursed with a curse. So what's that curse? I mean, we know the, the verses to talk about a man putting, you know, his money into a bag with holes and so forth. And Right. But this must also refer to the curse that comes with the neglect of the sabbatical rest of the land and so forth. Leviticus 20, yeah, 26. The 20, yeah, so the seven times. Exactly. Yeah. 
So here again, this letter is being written to a church that has turned away not only from the wife of their youth, which would be in, in what we were discussing a couple of weeks ago, the understanding of the need to investigate the word by line upon line and using Father Miller's rules. It's saying that this church is cursed because ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So it's being, this verse is being quite blunt that if we are turned away from what's being offered in Leviticus 25 and 26, and we are not willing to put forth the effort to study this and to come to not only an understanding, but a mutual understanding of, of what we're dealing with, that we're doing it for nothing. Now the word cursed and curse, they're based on the same word. Okay. Um, the Hebrew 779 is the word cursed, and with a curse is 3994, but it's based upon just a variation of the other word. It has a, a mem at the beginning, so that changes it. But this is a doubling. This is the midnight cry. Yep. So it, it's our need to be able to understand the first and the second angel's message before we can proceed to understand the righteousness by faith in verity, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where a lot of the, the recent studies that we've been doing, especially re-examining the seven times of Leviticus 26 have been so very important. We don't want to be cursed. We don't want to have to live under that curse. We don't want to be running away from people. We don't want to run away from those that would come at us. We don't want to have wild beasts coming into where we live or tearing things apart. You know, whether we're, we're dealing with that literally or figurative, we don't want either one. Mm -hmm. But ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And as the, just the, the different verses that were being addressed here. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and, hath, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Can't we trust our Heavenly Father's word? Hasn't he done exactly what he said he's going to do? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Is this what we want to see said about us? that we have been resisting the Holy Ghost, that we are being stiff-necked and uncircumcised? No. And we drop down here to the portions from the book of Nehemiah. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Here again, when, you're, when we are studying together because we wish to become either priests or Levites, we are also preparing for a work. 
But Nehemiah is noting here that the priests and the Levites that were supposed to be teaching others, they were out in the field. They were out tilling rather than teaching. Where are we to be today? We're to be teaching. We are to be showing to others that which we are learning. Malachi 3.10. And here, I'm going to read the alternate reading. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and empty out you a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. There's a song that many like to sing. There will be showers of blessings. Mm -hmm. How many times do we really put God to the test and cheerfully give to him and then see those showers come upon us? God has said that he will do it. And there would not be room enough to receive it. Excuse me, please, White. Sure. Uh, White. Yeah. Uh, God is saying to me now, he said, I tested of your faith and trust in me, dear friends. White, make me in peace and do my, do my teach and peace in my house. You do your job, right? My will is done, was in it. Heaven will be heaven in this oak. Using play. Mm -hmm. He is testing us. Do that. I think he's testing all of us. Yes, Mark. I would agree. Yes. Um, he is. Speak that to me now. You hear that, hear that call. Mm. Just hear that, that call. Just hear his voice, what he said to you, and hear that call. What do you think, Theodore? Well, yeah, we, we're definitely being tested. And we have to test God. We have to trust him. We have to prove him. Now, the promise that is made. Well, now the, well the meat here, okay. and the meat here is, of course, spiritual food. Right. So if we're looking at this properly, bring ye the offerings into the storehouse. And if we are the offering, we need to come to the storehouse. Mm -hmm. The meat being the spiritual food that then proves God that he is able and willing and capable to do exactly what he says he will do. Mm -hmm. Then he gives his promise, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not corrupt the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. 
So what would we see as the devourer? Well, those would be the en enemies of the truth. Satan trying to thwart our plans, your plans. Okay, and the devourer shall not corrupt the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Now, the vine, is that not representing doctrine? Mm -hmm. The fruits are representing those that would come in from the lessons being learned from the teaching that's being offered. Wouldn't that be correct? Mm -hmm. So then if, the, if, if he's going to rebuke the devourer, is this not rebuking the adversary that is attempting to sow tares in and among the wheat? Yeah. And also to destroy this message, this movement. Right. We have to have confidence that, that God... That God began this movement, and even though we don't see where it's going, that its purposes will be accomplished. When? Uh, me, please. I, I did search as I did say something to oh. my own phone. I did say to my own phone, excuse me, I did search on my own phone, I did search of the, the song. I searched on my phone, the school, saying, search of the song, name is Jesus, King of Angels. She says, King of an Angels. That kind of, of song. Okay. I like you to search about that. Okay, thanks, Mark. I look at the situation that we have seen and been seeing since July 18th. Mm -hmm. I look specifically at last December 6th. There are many applications, figurative applications that can be made but as we have been learning more, especially with the examples of chronology, especially with a lot of the other points that are not being currently addressed, I see our great need to continue with this kind of a study so that we can be prepared because when God decides that the Levites have been purified, that the priests have been made ready for their work. This work is going to go forward. It's going to go forward very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but I did watch David and my saying. I did watch uh, David Jeremiah saying, just get ready for God country. He coming in the same time. Pick up that people to follow him. And I ask you guys, help me to be get ready for that too. Please. 
Okay. We cannot be prepared if we're not willing to spend some time to understand what God's covenant is all about. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, were presented with a covenant. Now here, there are biblical as well as spirit of prophecy quotations that show that this covenant was presented well before the testimony of God's character, which we call the Ten Commandments, or as scripture calls the Ten Words. We have before us the example of the children of Israel having a covenant presented before them multiple times until finally in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is shown that these people that have accepted and given lip service to my covenant are going to turn their backs on me, that they are going to go forward in idolatry, and they're going to join with the nations all around me. Mm -hmm. That's no different than what we've seen within this church in four generations. We have to decide for ourselves if we're going to be part of this final generation. Mm -hmm. We have to decide for ourselves if we are going to have the faith of Abraham to say that God is capable of doing exactly what he says he will do. We have to decide if our faith is going to be placed in him or if our faith is going to be placed in other frail flesh. That, I think, is the challenge that we have today. And that is what is currently before us. It's been said many times that we should strive to become among the 144,000. How many of us are choosing to run a race where not only are we running it to the best of our ability, but we are helping where we can with our brothers and sisters to run that race. We need to ask ourselves what we really want right now. Are we willing to run this race to make it to the finish line? to be there when Christ returns? Or are we doing this because we think we ought to? Is this what we really want? And how can we show this? Do we really want God to empty out from the windows of heaven a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. Mm -hmm. 
consider this this week because much of what we've been seeing here in Malachi, much of what we're seeing in Exodus, in Leviticus, especially in Leviticus 25 and 26, are the things that we're not really seeing addressed within the bodies of the church. They want to talk about the love of Jesus. All we have to do is believe on Christ. But if we believe on him, don't we also take his word on everything else because he said it? Any other thoughts or any other comments? Okay. So the love of Jesus consists more than just lip service. That's what we've been saying, isn't it? Yep. That's what we've been saying, yeah. Too many times, in too many ways, we have been hearing words, and they want they want to attack the emotional heartstrings, but they're not getting to the real root of the matter. Right now, we're trying to get to the root of the matter. Because if we are not well grounded, if our faith is that where we have built upon sand, then we're going, we're, we're going to lose out. Then we have no foundation. If our faith, however, is built upon rock, the rock, then the tempests, the storms, they will all blow around us, but we would be firmly entrenched to be able to see. I go use a bevel. I let you talk to him. We would be able to see the benefits of where our faith is placed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Shall we now close? Mm -hmm. Gracious Father in heaven, help us that we may truly become like a miner searching for precious jewels in your word. Direct us to this end through this week. Help us so that we might consider the actions and decisions that we are led to each day. Show us, Father, where we are to walk for our own benefit and for the benefit of those with whom we come in contact. Direct us to this end, help us in this. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.